Shalom, everybody, to this uh, very last webinar of our Envision conference. This is week four of Envision 2022, and it's really hard to believe that we have come to the end of our amazing Envision week that was packed with so much content. And uh, I hope that this webinar today will be like at the wedding of Canaan, where they say they kept the best for the last, um, that we will have a webinar that will bless you all greatly. I do personally believe that this webinar is highly important, uh, not only for us as uh, um, those who, who speak to you from Jerusalem or to the Christian embassy. We are speaking today about a, a book and a subject that I believe is uh, going to have a great impact um, on the Christian Zionist movement and everybody, every pastor and every leader who wants to understand what God is doing with Israel and also what uh, Christian Zionism is all about. Now, it is no secret that Christian Zionism is a um, movement that is perceived by many as a very young and as a very uh, new movement um, to such a degree that if you go to an average Bible college today, a seminary or theological learning institute, there is very, very little teaching about Israel. And uh, because it is a relative new subject, but what is what this uh, webinar is all about today is that the subject is not so young as we think it is it didn't start with maybe the support of donald trump for for, for israel or of evangelical christianity or or, or uh, dispensationalist uh, teaching but christian zionist Minism is as old as the Protestant, the Reformed, the evangelical, global evangelical movement is. You find throughout the centuries um, adherents to this doctrine who discovered it from the Bible that God is going to restore Israel. Today we are going to speak about a very exciting book. It is a book that is called A Short History of Christian Zionism. It's written by Donald Lewis. Donald Lewis is a, he was a professor of church history at Regent College, not Regent College in the United States that you might know, but there is a, a college of the same name in Canada, Vancouver. He was a fellow of the Royal Historic Society in Canada, and he published over the past decades, something like 10 books, including in 2010, a book that is titled The Origin of Christian Zionism. Now, today we are speaking about this book, A Short History of Christian Zionism, which is a book you say, what is short? It's uh, short means it's around 350 pages, as uh, covers literally the, uh, the entirety of church history from the early church all the way to today. It even, we were very pleasant surprised. It even has a chapter on the, or uh, some content on the International Christian Embassy. But what really made this book so special is that I was reading that and I discovered it uh, maybe in uh, autumn last, last year. And reading through this book, I must say, I never learned so much from a book. And this is, uh, I say this unashamedly as uh, the president of one of the largest Christian Zionist movement. But Donald Lewis, Professor Donald Lewis, did an amazing job to compense, to uh, um, condense the history of Christian Zionism in a way like I've never seen before. It's a highly educational book, and today we are going to speak about it. Uh, what, what I rarely do, I gave all our vice presidents at the embassy some time ago some homework. I said, please read this book. It's a must read for us as leaders to understand that. And to my delight, they all read it and they shared the same enthusiasm like I had about the book of Donald Lewis. And I want to start with, with uh, Nicole Yoder, who's a vice president of our social initiatives and projects here in the land of Israel. Uh, Nicole, what, what is the main message you took away from that book and why should everybody around the world reading that book? Well, Jürgen, I think one of the, the quotes that I started right at the beginning of the book, um, Professor Emeritus of Biblical Studies at Regent College made a comment 
that it's a must read because Christian Zionism, Zionism shapes the identity of the church and its mission. It impacts political uh, international politics, and it gives to many their meaning in history. And I thought that was quite a remarkable statement at the beginning of the book. And as you read through the book, you begin to understand how um, the church over the years has had a, a, you know, shifting views from restorationism and the idea that the Jews would one day return to their land, but they, they, it's developed over time and how it's actually impacted the church's identity. It's impacted our uh, views of eschatology. And, and it is so, so true that these religious and theological views as they've developed over time have impacted international politics. And you don't hear much about the impact of the beliefs of the evangelical Christianity and the church and how foundational those were for the development of the state of Israel when it eventually happened. Um, as many of you may be aware, a lot of the, the early Zionists were actually secular people, but they were building off of a very long history and a uh, foundation within uh, the belief in the Bible that was throughout the England and American society that allowed there to be a popular view of support for this idea of a state when it came about. And so you, I remember hearing many times how foundational Christians were for the establishment of Israel and for Zionism, but I didn't, besides you know, knowing that there were people like Lord Shaftesbury in England who was foundational for the Balfour Declaration and, and uh, uh, Heckler who was very influential in helping introduce um, uh, Herzl to different political leaders, I really began to understand in a fresh way how much these uh, foundational biblical principles, books that were written, um, and you know, different uh, views of eschatology uh, were so widely um, uh, infused into the, the culture and the society that without that, there wouldn't have been the popular support for the state. And you see also many Jewish people who came to faith who were very, very foundational in this process. And I just found this all extremely um, eye-opening and enlightening as I read the book and really recommend it for anyone. It's even Jewish uh, Zionism. That's a statement that we got from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu years ago when he visited us at the Christian embassy on a Christian as a, at a Christmas reception. He says, you guys, you have been Zionists before we Jews have been Zionists. And of course, he knew our story with all the people that you mentioned, Lord Shaftesbury, William Heckler, etc. But uh, studying this book of uh, Donald Lewis uh, really highlights that the history of Christian Zionism as, as old as the Reformed Church or as the Reformation, the Protestant uh, Reformation came with Martin Luther and of course also with John Calvin. And um, in a way, maybe to uh, go back to my introduction, one of the reasons why we really felt this is important to speak about that book, we actually wanted to have Professor Lewis speak at our Envision Conference and to have him give a lecture at, our, at the conference. And it was really a very strange coincidence on the very day when I was sending him the invitation, I saw the note on the internet that Donald Lewis tragically with a, died in a premature death and a heart attack. Uh, he was le leaving a great legacy as a man of God in Vancouver. And it's really a pity that he's leaving such a void to us. And I, I hope that um, his, his family will find uh, the needed comfort. But one of the main points of that book is there is a chapter, chapter one, and I don't want to speak too much about that, that uh, encompasses the history of the church from the early church fathers. That means the uh, the post-apostolic time after the 12 apostles passed away, and then people like Justin the Martyr and Irenaeus and later on Origen, etc., took over the leadership in the church. There was very little uh, theology or doctrine about the Jewish people, mainly because the 
temple was being destroyed, and the conception was uh, perceived by the increasingly Gentile church that God must be finished with the Jewish people. And this understanding lasted on, and he really highlights that in a wonderful way, for many centuries, uh, even until the uh, 14th, 15th century, there were some uh, medieval theologians that uh, speculated, says there might be a future for the Jewish people, but this was definitely not the mainstream, but what really was a watershed, a paradigm shift on the theology in regard to Israel was the Reformation that was ushered both by Martin Luther and John Calvin. Now, Martin Luther is a tragic figure in, in himself. He was, in a way, very favorable, favorable to the Jews in his younger age of ministry. He turned against the Jews at the later stage of his ministry in a very bad way. It's not so clear with John Calvin. He didn't speak too much about the restoration of the Jewish people. But right after his uh, uh, his death, the, pe the person who took over the Reformation in Geneva, a gentleman called Bessa, he was the very first one who changed the vocabulary of the Reformed Church, where he says, Israel is not the church. Israel is not the is not Christianity. We did not replace is with the Jewish people, but he was the first one who, in his study Bible that was published, the Geneva Bible, for the first time, referred to Israel as quote unquote the nation of the Jews. And this was a, a spiritual earthquake in Christianity that uh, suddenly those two worlds were used together, the nation of the Jews, something that never existed in the century before. And in a way, this is the very foundation of Christian Zionism. And, uh, and, and in a way, this, this book from uh, Donald Lewis really very greatly underlines this amazing history. Uh, David Fenderwald in, in Finland, you have been reading the book. What was the most exciting thing for you when you studied that book? Yes, yeah, thank you, Jürgen. Um, yeah, what an exciting book and eye opener for any Christian Zionist or any Christian that um, believes in the restoration of Israel. Um, I think what has um, um, stood out for me from the beginning as I was reading the first paragraphs were actually just um, the terms of Christian Zionist and Christian Zionism. You now, where did this come from? You know, we are calling. I've heard these terms so much during our time, um, but where did I really come from? And it's been interesting enough that um, Donald was writing that the first time that Christian Zionist um, word actually was used was in 1896. And um, this was used by a Jewish leader called Theodore Herzl, um, calling uh, William Hechler a Christian Zionist, uh, because William Hechler, a Christian that believed in the restoration of Israel, um, was helping um, Theodore Herzl to make connections in the British um, government. And he called them a Christian Zionist. And this is already in 1896. And even just the word Christian Zionism, you know, was used, started being used in 1899 to 1905 um, by the Jewish people, um, interesting enough, not a Christian concept so much, uh, then a Jewish concept. Um, so the Jewish people were calling the Christians that were in favor of the Jewish people and the idea of having their own homeland. They called them Christian Zionists. But then there was a little bit of a, a break where people were not called so much Christian Zionist or Zionism up until 1939. And then really that um, phrase actually became quite popular actually only here in the 1980s and 1990s. And that is quite interesting because when you read the book, you can actually see that the so-called Christian Zionism is actually going already on for hundreds of years, as you said, Jürgen. Um, although those early um, theologians didn't call themselves Christian Zionists, more restorationists and so forth, actually the whole basis of this Christian Zionism is going back hundreds and hundreds of years already. And I think that is very interesting for us as Christian Zionists to um, to um, see in this book, actually. Um, other things that have really um, just um, um, talked to me a little bit is um, also the um, change in the mindset of the theologians during the years. And actually interesting enough for me it was the, um, Thomas Scott from 1747 to 1829 and with some others called Charles Simon and Edward um, Bitcher, Bitcher, 
Bickersteth. You know, they came up more with um, uh, theological teachings that were uh, more in line with um, showing love and esteem to the Jewish people, actually putting them in a positive light. So a complete turnaround where people will always teach about the Jewish people, that they are cursed or they are outcast or so forth. Um, but really a shift um, in their teaching that we should look favorable and um, lovingly on the Jewish people and much which the Christian embassy is doing today. You know, our uh, mandate is from Isaiah 40, comfort the comfort people. We're looking positively on them, love and esteem. So yeah, a big shift as Nicole and you also said during the years in how the theology changed, also the attitudes and now, if we think also about, wow, in us only year, maybe in the birth of the state of Israel, will Christian Zionists start making conferences and start helping with Aliyah and work like that. But actually, in us, we said before, even before the Jewish people were thinking about having their state or having a homeland, practically Jewish um, Christians were thinking about the restorations, but also with the Aliyah work. So by the time we had the Russian prom, um, um, persecutions and um, um, how's it exactly called um, Russian um, uh, pogroms. pogroms yeah yeah prom programs yeah basically we already then had um, William Blackstone um, saying listen guys we need to have a meeting mm -hmm. on this issue and with other Jewish people and interesting enough you know I one of the conferences you can actually call the Christian Zionism conference Judeo-Christian relations conference was in Chicago in 1891. And interesting, he called it the past, the present, and the future of Israel. And this is in 1891. And this was, of course, um, because of the brutal Russian pogroms that were happening, and they wanted to help those Russian Jews. Um, and we all know from that, um, Russian programs actually started the first Aliyah. So very interesting, um, I think, if you start reading the book, you start to realize that, you know, this is a long history of Christian Zionism here, way before our time. It's not something that happened just with the birth of the state of Israel or in the 1980s with the Christian embassy, but this is going on for a long time, and it's really a move of God's spirit. And as people have got a new revelation about the word of God, and of course, it impacts really everything. And it is quite a big shame that we don't see more of this teaching in the theology schools out there. And I think that will be the big challenge. But yeah, anybody that is a leader in theology, love Israel, or is wondering about Israel, it, this is a book you should read. And this is just some of the things that spoke to me um, clearly, Jürgen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing, you know, to see this long history of uh, Christian supporters of Israel who had a biblical understanding. This this was, and I, I want everybody on this call also to remember that in those days, the, the centuries where David was speaking about, there was no state of Israel yet. The Jewish people were living in dispersion all around the world. The Jewish leaders and the documents, the book documents this very well. They themselves didn't believe in a restoration of the Jewish state. They actually believed in the fulfillment in the uh, uh, countries and the diaspora where they were living to bring forth messianic-like times in the diaspora, and that that's what they saw as their future. But uh, he showed that there were Christians who believed that God is going to restore them one day. And this is absolutely fascinating, the way how it is documented. And Barry, what, was, uh, uh, what were the points that were important for you as you were studying that book? Well, I don't know how to emphasize enough my love for this book. Um, other than tell a little story, I'm a book lover. My wife jokes that she doesn't have to worry about me um, spending money anywhere unless I'm in a bookstore. I'll go <laughs> into a bookstore and I may come home with, you know, three or four bags of books. But I'm such an avid reader. Most books I read once and, and I give away, pass them on. I'm in the midst of reading this my second time. <laughs> Just the first chapter struck me so that I put down my pen and I said, okay, I'm going to read it through without making a note. And now I'm reading it again, underlining, making notes, starring things, looking at things I want to study deeper. Um, 
Also, you made a mention, Jorgen, of something that as I read this book struck me personally. You talked about how the Geneva Bible was the first English translation that highlighted Israel as the land and the people. Um, recently, one of my aunts um, has tracked down our ancestors and I have an ancestor on my mother's side, a John Ogden, who when he settled in the colonies, what is today New Jersey, he brought his Geneva Bible published in the 1600s. And it's a part of the museum there. And that just, you know, whether or not it played any part in his understanding of God, it's like, okay, 10 generations ago, uh, my forefathers were at least had access to read the Bible where it talked about Israel as a real land and place. Um, one of the things that struck me was his drawing out the fact that today's modern understanding of nationhood and nationalism, which comes out of the British forging of a British national identity, um, for the British was came out of their reading of the nation of Israel in the Bible. And so God's covenant with covenant with the nation of Israel and choosing a nation and a nation being a, a unique people with unique borders um, has formed our geopolitical understanding for the last several hundreds of years. Um, and that you know, doesn't necessarily impact my love of Israel today, but it it shows something on how we, I guess a big difference that I see between we evangelical Christians and our memory and the Jewish people in their memory. For many evangelicals, church history begins the day we meet Jesus because we emphasize a one-on-one -on -one salvation experience. And so then when we read the Bible, we, it, it means whatever it means to us in our newborn faith with Jesus. And we don't look back at the history, which is, is, is a cultural conflict with the Jewish people. Because from the time of Moses, they are taught, train your children and your grandchildren to remember, don't forget. Um, and this this book to me illustrated so much of church history and of church theology about Israel that we've forgotten. And so I'm grateful that the Lord stirred Donald Lewis to, to catalog this information, put it in such a useful resource. Finally, in closing for me, I, I realized how much dispensational theology has had an impact on modern evangelical theology. Mm -hmm. At the same time, how, how wrong it's been over the last several hundred years, and yet it's always been able to recorrect when the date for Jesus to return or the date of the rapture or whatever didn't happen. Um, it's an amazingly adaptable and enduring theology. Um, even though I personally still have some major differences with it. You just joined our webinar in the last uh, 15, 20 minutes. We are speaking about this book, A Short History of Christian Zionism, a book uh, brought forth by the late Donald Lewis. It's a brand new book. It just came out in the market last year. As I said before, we wanted to have him as a guest speaker at the Envision Conference. Unfortunately, the Lord took him home to be with him uh, just on the day when we invited him to join us at the Envision Conference. And we just felt in a way this in a way, in a supernatural way, in a tragic way, underlined for us the importance even of that book. Uh, and we want to encourage you. There was a question I saw later on, how can we get hold of this book? And um, this is available in our bookstore. There was just a moment ago a screen. You will see it here exactly, icjstore.com. That's where you can get the book. And we don't do this in order to make money, but we really feel it's an absolute necessary book for the body of Christ today that helps us to understand what a God is doing in the Christian Zionist movement. Now, Maimir, you are working for decades uh, in the Christian Zionist movement. You have been leading the work of the ICJ for uh, two decades.
decades in Czech Republic. You have been serving uh, as the international vice president, or I think even three decades in Czech Republic. And you have reading a book, book about the subject you have been spending your life at. Was it something that you could learn something new from? Absolutely, again, and I can just echo what the others have already said. It is a remarkable book. And uh, for me, it actually reassured me that I am indeed in a very good family. And this is one of the main takeaways of this book, uh, that Christian Zionism did not start in a few, uh, few decades ago. And it is also not an expression of this uh, a uh, special type of theology called the dispensational or pre-millennial dispensationalist. Uh, by far, it is a much uh, wider stream, which started much, much earlier. And just like you said, it actually started with the Reformation. And to me, this is a wonderful example of the good fruit which comes out of reading the Word of God. Because these people were, did not even call themselves Christian Zionists, as, as David pointed out, we were called that way by others, by, by externals, by Theodor Herzl first. Uh, but what these people did, they just tried to understand the Bible, they read the Bible, and they were praying to get the proper understanding. And as a result, they soon understood that the Jewish people, first of all, were not replaced by the church, that the Jewish people have their own future in God's, in God's plan, and eventually that they will also be restored to their land. So this all flowed from a fresh reading of the Bible. And I really like what David Fondervald already mentioned, how this teaching of esteem came about in the 1600s. Uh, when I speak about Christian-Jewish relations, I often refer to the term teaching of content. That is what the Christian church was doing for 1500 years, teaching that the Jews are the enemies of God and Christians should hate them and persecute them. And that there was nothing but content for the Jewish people. And that sowed, unfortunately, the seeds of anti-Semitism all over Europe and elsewhere. Uh, but what happened, and uh, it is especially uh, true of the Puritans, this group uh, of evangelicals which uh, uh, started in England in the 1600s, and this is also important because uh, the founding fathers of America were among them. So this group also influenced from the very foundation, uh, the United States, and that's quite important to understand. So what these people did was a complete turnaround uh, from the previous teaching of content. And uh, uh, Don Lewis uh, uses five words that really spoke to me when he describes their attitude towards the Jewish people. Esteem, gratitude, love, longing, and realism. And when I read that, I said to myself, well, this is exactly what the ICJ has been doing. First of all, the esteem. The Jewish people are not to be despised but there is esteem because they have been chosen by God for a special purpose. And we just respect what God did. Gratitude, because, and we speak about it very often, we owe the Jewish people, the Bible, the word of God, the concept of the one true God, creator of the universe, and the Messiah. So we should be grateful. Love for the Jewish people, because God loves them. It's so clearly in the scripture. So again, this is what we are preaching and trying to practice. And then longing for their conversion, longing for them to understand, to, to come to the fullness of the revelation that God has for them. That's obviously uh, in, uh, present in every Christian who loves the Jews. And then the realism, that's the part that, uh, derived from uh, Apostle Paul when he writes in Romans 11, that they are still beloved by God because of their forefathers, but uh, in terms of the gospel, there are enemies. So these people already 400 years ago, they understood that uh, it will not be easy to convert the Jews. And they also understood that later on that uh, to bring them to Messiah does not mean that they should be stripped of all their Jewish heritage. That's another important aspect which uh, we also uh, implement today. So again, what the Puritans have taught and preached 400 years ago, this is very much what the ministry of the ICJ is built around. 
Now that gives me a, a feeling of a solid foundation. And here's another takeaway that I took. I learned a little bit about some of the theological terms of, uh, especially in uh, eschatology, and uh, you have this pre-millennial and post-millennial uh, and historicist approach. And uh, what I learned from that is that one should be rather cautious when applying this historicist approach. Now, historicism means that we take some important events and developments in the current world and try to map it on the Bible, especially the Revelation and passages from Daniel, which speak about the future events. And we try to identify what is going on currently with some of these, you know, what is the, the beast and the, the harlot and, you know, identify with these uh, characters described in those prophetic writings. And the history shows that those who are very adamant uh, about identifying these biblical concepts with something specific they saw around them, they were invariably wrong. Sometimes it even led to the prediction of the exact day of Christ's coming or the rapture. They were all wrong. And so I, I can understand that it is quite tempting. Now we see that uh, there's a major force in the world there have always been things like that. In Europe, for centuries, that was the Turk, was the major enemy. So he was identified with, uh, with the Harlem or with the beast. And it uh, was replaced later on, or at the same time, with the Pope. And later on, it was replaced by the Soviet Union. That was the bear of Gog and Magog. And you know, history went its own way. And all these very concrete applications proved wrong. And uh, I think it's just a warning to every one of us. We, we should hear, read the Bible. We should ask the Holy Spirit for clarity that maybe, just maybe, that we will not know it until it happens. Because Jesus says even he doesn't know the day. So we should be careful in, in making all these applications because that can easily lead us astray. And then as a result, when it doesn't happen, people are disappointed. And I think that the ICJ, one of our strengths has always been balance. And this is what we have, you know, preached and, and spoken about in this, in this balanced way, uh, concentrating on that which is solid and clear, that is mainly the faithfulness of God, his covenants, which cannot be changed. And on this basis, both the Jewish restoration is taking place and also our attitude and our mission towards the Jewish people. Yeah, you are, they, Mahmoud, you're absolutely right. It's a very interesting read to see how, in a way, you know, the criticism that we hear today, people who criticize Christian Zionism around the world, they say, oh, this is a typical dispensational teaching. Many even add to it that comes from America. And this book really highlights that throughout the centuries, Many different schools of eschatology, they understood from the Bible that God is restoring the Jewish people one day. So it's not the teaching of one particular school of eschatology, but throughout history, if they were amillennialists, postmillennialists, premillennialists, they all understood from the Bible that if one thing is clear, then is that it is that God is restoring the Jewish people. At the end time, it's also important to know that at least the way how I read it is that Donald Lewis, uh, this is again the book that we are speaking about, a short history of Christian Zionism. He doesn't, at least it seems to be not in, to endorse one particular uh, stream of uh, eschatology, but he just gives in a neutral way a, 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 a look at the history and um, and show sometimes, like, like Moimir said, also the traps that sometimes people who are too eager to uh, pinpoint certain things that are happening today with prophecy uh, that uh, in history they all um, went down with great shame. However, they were all right in one thing that God would indeed restore the Jewish people back to their homeland. And um, I want to maybe before I go to you, David, just, you know, I highlighted a lot of passages in this book. There are really, truly gems that can be found in that book, little quotes and stories. Um, <clears throat> One of them was mentioned before that um, that um, the, the the way how 
the, the um, Jewish people were considered in regard to the gospel. And, uh, you know, for Jewish audience, of course, this is might be hard to digest, but there was for centuries the doctrine uh, in the church that God is finished with the Jewish people, even to such a degree that it will be very, very difficult for them to be saved. And if they need to get uh, come to faith to their Messiah, they need to become like the Catholics are, or they need to become Christians. And they're emerged with the Puritan movement for the first time, an understanding that they have their own identity, that God is dealing with them in a new way. They understood that, of course, like Paul says, the gospel is first to the Jewish people. If there is a nation that has a right to hear the good news about Yeshua, it is the Jewish people. But like Moimel rightly said, it doesn't mean they have to become like the Gentiles. They need to cherish and endorse their traditions. Uh, one of the interesting um, um, points that are highlighted, there was a, a quite a major clerical um, um, theologian in the United Kingdom. He lived between 1759 to 1836. And he published in 1818 uh, a, a sermon and put a booklet out of that. And the title of that sermon was the following. It is a Jew who is at the moment, <laughs> it is a Jew who is at this moment interceding for us at the right hand of God. Now, if you read that subject, this was a earthquake for many Christians to think that there is a Jew at the right hand of the Father interceding for the church. And this will not new theological discoveries, but this were already around. Another little story, the same theologian, Charles Simeon, he was uh, sitting at a, co at a conference. Uh, David Fendelwald mentioned him, Bickersteth, another theologian that believed in the restoration of the Jewish people. And it said that then during that conference, they were exchanging little notes, and uh, Bickersteth handed over to si Simeon a slip of paper with the following question. Six million of Jews, this was the population of Jews at that time in 1818, uh, uh, all 600 million Gentiles, what is more important? And that's quite a question. Simeon wrote back on a little note, he says, well, if the spiritual restoration of the six million means death, life from the dead for the 600 million, then the answer is very obvious what is more important. And it's quite amazing the thinking that existed already long before there was a Christian under, uh, Christian embassy or Christian Zionist organization where they understood the importance of the Jewish people in regard to salvation history. And David, one of the subjects that was uh, coming up again and again was dispensationalism. And I think many people on our call might not even know, they might have heard that for the first time. First of all, David, if you can highlight a little bit uh, the uh, what is really dispensationalism and why uh, Donald Lewis' book is so important in that regard, in, re in regards to Christian Zionism, David? And thanks, Jürgen. Yeah, first, let me uh, clarify that uh, we ordered 70 of these books about three or four months ago, and we're waiting for them to get here so we can uh, fulfill orders. But I think uh, because of Corona, there's this lag, this uh, supply side lag of, of slow shipping and all. We're still waiting for some. We ordered four or five uh, months ago, but uh, it will be on, available on the ICEJ bookstore, icejstore.com uh, very soon. I think maybe we can go ahead and put up uh, a pre-order up there for people who want it. I don't know about other languages, but it should be in other languages through InterVarsity Press, probably even on, on Amazon. And uh, Jürgen, I think on dispensationalism in so many other areas, we really owe a debt of gratitude to this man who just passed away. It's a shame we couldn't have him at Envision. The timing is quite uh, unusual. But um, I got to meet him uh, back in 2016, I think. He came uh, to uh, observe, let's say, you know, he wanted to worship Jesus, of course, at the Feast of Tabernacles, but he wanted to observe our ministry as part of, a re uh, of his research. And uh, he was a very gracious man. And when you look at him, uh, I've been longing for this sort of book 
especially on this question of dispensationalism for a, a long time. And I think he has pro finally provided within one book, cover to cover, the sort of response we need to give to a lot of the, I, I just think it's like blood libels against us that we're, we're here. Our motivation is, is just to uh, bring back Jesus and we're thirsting for Armageddon and such. He studied, he got a doctorate at Oxford while he was there, I, um, I guess he was studying the origins of Christian Zionism. You know, before Herzl used that phrase, coined the phrase Christian Zionism at the first Zionist Congress, they were known as restorationists in Britain, basically was the term. So the movement predated Jewish Zionism. Uh, and he wrote a book on the origins of Christian Zionism that was published by Cambridge Press. So he's a good Canadian professor who's got a doctorate at Oxford, published a book on Christian, early Christian Zionism at, uh, at Cambridge. And then he, uh, when I met him, he uh, talked about how he was a church historian who was really interested in, in the latter rain movement, what we call today the renewalist movement, which is a combination of the Pentecostal movement from Azusa forward and the charismatic revival and even some of the waves of, uh, you know, Holy Spirit filled impacted uh, uh, movement since then. You, you throw it all together under renewal, renewalist and renewal Zionism. And uh, uh, I've been here um, for, you know, 25 years when I first came to the embassy. Um, we, uh, I took on the job of being our media uh, spokesman. And within a year and a half, we got up into, the, I came in 97, by the middle of 98, we were in the, uh, already starting to get a lot of this millennial hype around the year 2000, and all the crazy Christians who were becoming here to blow up the Dome of the Rock and to force Armageddon and all this. And there was all this reporting in the mainstream media. I interviewed with hundreds, 200 mainstream media at the time, BBC, New York Times, CNN, everyone. And uh, I had to go learn a little about dispensationalism myself. I grew up in the Bible Belt. I knew little pieces of teachings, prophetic teachings, but I didn't know. And here you got all these uh, reporters relying on really shoddy scholarship that's that basically, as Jurgen was suggesting, and and Moimir, that the whole Christian Zionist movement is of recent American origin, inspired by John Nelson Darby, the the Scottish Brethren, the Schofield Bible, uh, and uh, that the whole Christian Zionism is basically based on dispensational premillennial beliefs. What is it? It's it's a um, dispensationalism is a uh, theological prophetic view that uh, um, when John Nelson Darby developed it, others helped it, but he was the main proponent of it, that the, he, he felt there were different, he believed there were different ways of salvation in different eras or dispensations. In other words, we, we believe the only way to be saved is through Christ, either looking forward to it like Abraham or David, and you can find scriptures that say exactly that, or we looking back at the cross, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And he said, you know, you're saved based on the revolution, revelation at your time. But he said, look, there were different ways, age of grace, age of law, age of this or that. And uh, one of the things that the dispensationalists did that is really getting corrected today by what are called uh, progressive dispensationalists is he divided up the body of Christ or the family of the redeemed, that the, the Gentile church, God was, we were in the church age, God was mainly in this age or dispensation, God was primarily interested in the church, it was Gentile predominantly. And when Christ comes in the pre-tribulation rapture, we're going to heaven and, uh, and our destiny, our salvation destiny is up in heaven. And that then it, God will turn his attention back to Israel for the short seven years of the tribulation. They go through hell, two thirds die so that one third finally call on Jesus. 
and at Christ's, uh, well, I guess you could call it his, his third coming or his second one, you know, in the future, uh, they would serve the Lord here on the earth. He would reign in heaven through us, but through the Jewish people serving here on earth. And there was a real division in the body of Christ, whereas Paul, uh, Jesus says there's one sheepfold, one shepherd, one gate. And Paul says there's one faith, uh, one Messiah, one body. They, they separated it. And I think uh, even a lot of Messianic Jews who have certain dispensational thinking, they say we can no longer adhere to that. There's one body of Christ, Jews and, and Gentile together in Christ, one new man. This is one of the things that this book helps us understand. And, uh, I, you know, you finally have a book that uh, it really helped me understand some of the errors of dispensational teaching, some of the things where they might have gotten it right. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's very helpful. But it also will be, I believe, very um, effective that any journalist now who, who tries to taint us or smear us, mm -hmm. that, you know, we're just here, our motivation is to see two thirds of the Jews die. So one third finally call on Jesus just to get them converted. And we're trying to force Armageddon. I'll tell you, Jurgen, I have about a foot, foot and a half of space on one shelf in my, on my bookshelves at home, my personal library with books about how, you know, we're all, it, they're entitled allies for Armageddon on the road to Armageddon, thirsting for the apocalypse, all this nonsense. Now, any journalist who does this and says, ropes us all together, lumps us all together and, and impugns our motives in a certain way that it's not about love and esteem and gratitude, but uh, about, you know, just longing for the world to blow up. It is a blood libel, just like the blood libels against the Jews. And I think we should be very aggressive we should have an extra stack of these copies and any journalist that, that does this, we give them a copy and then we warn them you have to retract it. Because uh, one of the good things about this book, it was like a, also a mirror that you could hold up against yourself and see exactly where you are. When you see the history of the movement, some of the errors and detours they took, some of the things they got right, where are we today? I think he was very uh, positive and gracious about uh, the things he wrote about the Christian embassy. And uh, I, you know, I, I think we, uh, God has been very gracious in opening up our understanding. Uh, our motive is love, is esteem, is gratitude, is respect is obedience. We're commanded to love them, to show them mercy. Uh, and, and he steps away. He shows how the movement has gone global and in a way how it stepped away from a, a, an obsession with the dark side of, of biblical prophecy and is more interested in a now faith what, I, what I've always, uh, uh, how I've described us, we, uh, we pursue a responsible brand of Christian Zionism that looks for timely, pragmatic, practical ways to help Israel and the Jewish people right now where they are. And even though we, you know, try to understand Bible prophecy and it's important, we study it, we teach on it, we're not obsessed with it. And uh, we're going to, to live every day the way Jesus wants us to live today towards his own people. Yeah, and David, like you said, this is uh, so important to um, study this book, uh, in particular also in light of dispensationalism and Christian Zionism. Uh, I think one of the sentences that I underlined also in the book was where he says, well, if you would brand Charles Darby, John Darby, the founder of dispensationalism as a Christian Zionism. I think he quotes one of the early uh, theologians from that time. He says, Mr. Darby didn't move a finger to help the Jewish people. 
And so to say that this is really uh, what Christian Zionism is, is today about, it's absolutely uh, wrong. And I think this book really uh, very clearly shows that. That's one more subject that I would like uh, to raise up that also uh, can be seen uh, very prominently in that book. And this is about Christians uh, of Jewish origins. Of course, today we call them Messianic Christians, uh, Messianic believers. In that time, this uh, uh, this uh, term didn't exist yet, but they were called Christians of Hebraic or Hebrew origins. And it's quite amazing and interesting to see also the prominence that he gives them in the in helping the church to understand the nature of Judaism, the calling of the Jewish people, the importance of the nation of Israel. And uh, one of the uh, quite amazing surprises for me was, which I never knew is that Lord Balfour, when he was writing the Balfour Declaration, uh, he says there were around three, four Hebrew Christians that were teaching him about the prophetic future of the Jewish people, and that those Messianic Jews, they instructed him, he says, England needs to stand with the Jewish people. We need to help the Jewish people uh, for their own state, and God will bless England for that. And that was one of the uh, motivators for Lord Balfour to bring forth the famous Balfour Declaration in the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And uh, throughout history, throughout the emergence of Christian Zionism, those uh, we would call them today messianic believers, they have been instrumental in educating the church on the Jewish roots of their faith, helping them to understand the Talmud, rabbinical Judaism, and even enlightening, enlightening Christianity uh, through that. And that's also something which goes like a threat uh, through many of the pages. Maybe one last word, and uh, this is the end of the, the book also, where he makes a very good an analysis of what is happening today, the change of Christian Zionism, where he rightly notes also something that we have been speaking about over the last decade or so, is that Christian Zionism today is definitely not anymore a American, Northern uh, European or Western European phenomenon, but that the majority of Christian supporters for Israel today, they come from Africa, they come from Southeast Asia, they come from India, they come from Latin America. And uh, actually so the support, the full-hearted support that existed maybe in Europe and in North, North America is probably embattled like never before uh, in the history of the church. And uh, there's, however, a very growing movement of supporters of Israel in the global south. Maybe if any one of you has a, a short final word on the book, uh, Nicole, I start again with you. Well, I think um, uh, if I final uh, word for me is that um, this country, as we can see today, it's it's the center of what's going on. Um, I really appreciate what you're saying about the you know even though maybe some nations. Um, formulated their identity around their response to the Jewish people, and they um, wanted to do what they could to help it become uh, a reality. It's absolutely something, as you say, that's all over the world today. Israel is a focal point because God's doing something special, and we all have the opportunity to be a part of it. And, and it is a significant part of us understanding our faith. And so hmm. um, it's really important for us to, to dig in and, and to learn as much as we can about what God's doing and to ask him what he has uh, for us to do to be a part of it. Well, thanks so much, Nicole. David van der Waal, your final words on Donald Lewis' book. Yeah, once again, excellent book. And I think this is a topic that's never going to be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It's only going to be more relevant. And we're going to see, as we see this already around the world, in Africa, in Asia, basically, it's a topic that every Christian uh, is going to have to face and going to have to make up where they stand towards Israel. And uh, hopefully they will all find through this book the answers and uh, that they know that through Israel, you know, that will be a blessing to them, but also that we can be a blessing to Israel. So, yeah, that's my closing words. Um, take it serious. This is not going away. It's only going to grow because this is a move of God from the beginning. 
So. Amen. And maybe one note for me. I see there are quite a number of questions. Is this book in Spanish? Is this book in, in French? I want to encourage you go to the publisher and write them. You say, we need this book in our language. I believe it really will be a blessing for every country. Please do that. If you want to help the publisher to do it and to help with the translation, I think it's a, an important uh, book that needs to be translated. Barry, what is your final word? <clears throat> Well, there's a, a verse we oftentimes talk about from Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. And here at Envision, what we're trying to do is provide pastors, leaders, people of influence, even if they're not in the ministry, they may be business people, they may lead a home study, wisdom, biblical-based wisdom, um, so that they can flourish and those that they influence can flourish and this book is an excellent resource of god's wisdom from the church over centuries um, and it gives you insight into the scriptural promises of what we see today this miracle restoration of israel and so for me a biblical based historical based understanding for um is always of value to those in leadership and ministry. Amen. And if I can add to that, if you are watching and listening to this program and you might happen to be a, a seminar teacher in a Bible seminary or even a leader of, a, of a, a Christian institution of learning, please make this subject a subject of learning in your institution. Educate pastors. Everybody said it, and it's I can just repeat it. It's not going to be a way. And I think this book should become a must read in many theological institutions around the world. Moimir, uh, your final parting words on Don Lewis's book. Well, this whole discussion reminds me of the verse from the New Testament, uh, which is a good rule. If it is from God, no one will be able to stop it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is manifested in what we uh, talk about, because this whole Christian Zionist thing is much bigger than any one of us. And I was really encouraged to see uh, how God used weak men throughout generations. They got it right. Sometimes they got it wrong. They didn't have the whole picture, but, but God used them to uh, restore this understanding of his plan with the Jewish people uh, in the church. And not only the understanding, but he actually moved people to do something practical for the Jews. And it's to me, it's the glory of God that actually it, were, it was Christians who were Zionists first before the Jews, and they helped the Jews as, uh, achieve what God had always intended to them. So this is a great source of encouragement, and it's a privilege that we can play a part in it. Amen. Thanks so much, uh, Moimia. And David, a, a parting word from you? Yes. Uh, look, I, this is a, 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 seri a, a serious work of scholarship by a serious uh, church historian. And and so, you know, there's a lot of complex ideas and long words with long definitions, but I think he really made an effort to make it as, uh, as simple as he could in some of the main important areas so that, you know, normal people can read this and really get a lot out of it, even though it's a scholarly work. And I think one of the ways that he really captured this is in this phrase, uh, I love it, Sunday school Zionism. And he says people like uh, President Truman, who recognized Israel, or even today when, when I uh, worked as a lobbyist in Congress for Israel back in the 90s, the, the Jewish lobby was there, APAC, there were a lot of Jews there who were uh, elected to the Congress and all, but the pro-Israel support in Congress, consensus, bipartisan among both parties in those days, to this day, decades ago, the real foundation of it is it's Christians who grew up with a basic Sunday school understanding that the Israel of the Bible is the same as the Israel to, of, uh, of today. That thought and that basic, simple core belief 
has gone global and we see it in our movement, even among the variety of people here. And that's something that we can just keep, have confidence. It's a simple message, just keep going. And that the, the God is still working through the Israel people, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, and through the church at the same time. And we have a common destiny. He mentions that, the common destiny you have, and it's exciting to be part of it. Amen. Amen, amen. And again, a reminder for everybody who was with us today on this uh, webinar. We have been talking about Donald Lewis's book, A Short History on Christian Zionism. Um, I believe it's for the first time we have done such a, a book review. And I think for the first time that we really felt to give an orchestrated endorsement on that book, uh, because we do feel it's an important read for everybody who cares about Zion, about the Jewish people, who wants to understand the movement that is standing with Israel, to understand that there is a long history, great man of God behind it, people like John Wesley, Charles uh, uh, Spurgeon, people like the German Puritans and Count Zinzendorf, you will read about them all in the book of Donald Lewis, and you will see that you're standing on the shoulders of an incredible legacy of men of God and women of God who understood that God's promises with the Jewish people, they are yes and amen, and there is no wavering with God in the fulfillment of them. And that's why we felt today that we bring you uh, this uh, book review because I, it was greatly encouraging to all of us very educational. Again, you can get it at our bookstore, and we hope you uh, will be as blessed as we were uh, and, and still are as we are reading it. Some of us, uh, you heard from Barry, even for the second time, and uh, it is definitely a book that uh, you will be blessed. Also, uh, another comment, there's uh, many, many uh, footnotes at the end where if you want to read more about a subject, the book enables you to find more resources on individual subject so you can dig in even deeper than that book. So that's uh, brought our webinar today to a conclusion. We spoke about Donald Lewis' book, A Short History on Christian Zionism. This also was the last webinar of our Envision Conference 2022 at 8 o'clock. I want to make sure every one of you will be joining us. We will have the closing uh, uh, main session that is coming from the Envision Conference, our keynote session. We have with us an amazing pastor from Jordan, uh, Pastor uh, um, Afif Salah, is joining us from Jordan, gives us an inspiring message. We will be joined by Fabian Kretsch, who will give us an amazing testimony of what God is doing in Iraq today. And I know you have been, we will be greatly blessed. I think, Barry, you have been uh, recording an interview with Stephen Curry that also will be broadcasted tonight in this uh, broadcast. So it will be a great time. It's the closing program of the Envision program. Those of you who, who subscribe to the program, everything that you watch, including this webinar today, will be available on our platform till the end of April. So you can revisit all the different webinars, all the different sessions, seminars, and keynotes that we were uh, bringing to you. And I want to thank you personally for attending the Envision Conference, and I hope you will bless this last session, our keynote session, that will be broadcasted at 8 o'clock tonight. God bless you. <laughs>